You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Good afternoon, and thank you for tuning in to WCAT Radio's Vows, Vocations, and Promises, Discerning the Call of Love. I am your host, Dr. Marianne Erlakis. On today's episode, I have the privilege of speaking with Dr. Evan, Father Evan Koop, an ordained Roman Catholic priest from the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis in Minnesota, a member of the community of the Companions of Christ, a faculty member for St. Paul's Seminary and School of Divinity, and a doctoral candidate regarding his contribution to a comprehensive and timely new book entitled Spiritual Husbands, Spiritual Fathers, Priestly Formation in the 21st Century, a book that has been edited by Bishop Philippe Estevez and uh, Bishop Andrew Cousins, published by Holy Apostles College and Seminaries and Route Books and Media. Welcome, Father Coop. Thank you for joining me here on WCAT Radio. Thank you, Dr. Marianne. It's very uh, wonderful to be here with you. I'm eager to hear both about your dissertation topic and its fruitful sure. research um, uh, in your chapter, Chapter 4, entitled Mary as the Bridal Companion of the Priest. Um, but before we begin, would you be so kind as to lead us in prayer? Sure, Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, we give you praise and thanks for the gift of your Blessed Mother Mary, and especially for the gift that she is to every priest. I ask that you would bless this conversation, breathe forth your Holy Spirit upon us, fill us with your grace, that we may truly speak of you and hear your voice as we contemplate the beauty of our Blessed Mother Mary and her unique relationship to each and every priest as spiritual bride. We ask this through your most holy name, Jesus, you who are Lord forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father Coop. Beautifully prayed. Thank you. I'm delighted that you were able to join me today on WCAT Radio's Vows, Vocations, and Promises Discerning the Call of Love. Um, would you tell our listeners a bit about your own vocation story? Sure, yeah, I'm happy to, um, especially because it really, uh, the genesis of this article that I, that I wrote for this book, Spiritual Husbands and Spiritual Fathers, really does have a lot to do with just kind of my own, my own life and the life of uh, the priestly community of which I'm a part, the Companions of Christ. So it's all kind of uh, bundled up in, in one mystery. Um, so uh, I'm from uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, and uh, I've been a priest now since 2012, uh, ordained uh, in 2012 as a priest for the Archdiocese. Um, and really my um, call to priesthood, my discerning of my priestly vocation was just a very gradual uh, process in my, in my life. Um, there weren't a lot of dramatic um, turning points that I, can, that I can really point to. Um, I grew up in a wonderful Catholic family, the youngest of, of four children, um, and always grew up going to mass and everything like that. Uh, so it was about um, when I was in early high school, I think, that I began to to really consider a priestly vocation. At that point, it was more of, uh, I, was, I was afraid uh, of the idea of it and kind of tried to stuff it in the background, but it, it was always there and it kept growing. Um, and, and over time, God gently and beautifully showed me um, just how this vocation corresponded to, to the deepest needs and desires of my heart, especially the desire that I'd had uh, from a very young age to belong to God completely, uh, is how I would describe it. So when I was a small child, I never really, I never thought of priesthood, but definitely was deeply interested in things of God and wanting to belong to him, fascinated by him, and wanting to possess him and be possessed by him. Um, ever since when I was about five years old, my mother had, had uh, led me in a, a process and a prayer of giving my whole life uh, to God. And, and I, I distinctly remember that moment as a young child. And, and so that had a great impression on me. And, 
But once I began to think about priesthood, it really uh, began to speak to that desire to belong completely to God, which I think also at its roots is, is the essence of the, the celibate vocation. Um, so by the time I was re- really ready to discern priesthood and say, I want to, um, I want to pursue this and, and uh, understand more clearly if this is where God is calling me, uh, it was at the end of college uh, and after I had I had spent two years as a focus missionary, uh, so I was uh, doing evangelization on college campuses with the Fellowship of Catholic University students, and I'd had a deep experience of Christian community um, through through that ministry, that apostolate, uh, just a wonderful organization, uh, focus. Uh, and so by the time I was ready to say, okay, I need to really discern this priestly vocation, um, I actually was more interested in religious life at that point um, because of this image I had in my head of uh, diocesan priesthood, parish priesthood, as essentially um, solitary uh, and also uh, more taken up with matters of just church administration, things like that. I wanted something more radical, but most of all, I wanted, I knew that I would thrive in a community uh, and, and that community, just like family, is really necessary for growth in holiness and Christian discipleship. So I was looking at religious orders, uh, but then a very wise person um, in my life uh, spoke to me about this community of diocesan priests, the Companions of Christ, who um, were formed in my own home diocese, uh, the Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis, in 1992. Uh, and so I took some time, I took about a week uh, to, to, to live with, with the, the priests and, and the brothers here at our house in St. Paul, uh, and it was an immediate fit. I really just felt this is where the Lord is calling me to be. This is the fulfillment of all my desires. Um, and, and it was a particular call. It was very, it was very much like uh, the Lord wants me to be with these particular brothers uh, in my life Um, and this is where I feel most truly myself Um, so that's how I I entered um, seminary as a member of the Companions of Christ so a lot of people may have not heard of uh, our our, um, priestly association before we are not a religious community we are diocesan priests um, like any other priest um, but we, uh, we have a, a rule of life. We have statutes, uh, canonical statutes that are approved by the diocese. And it's actually something that the Second Vatican Council called for, was uh, for even for uh, official associations to be formed among diocesan priests. Uh, and it even says um, in, in the document on priestly life, um, with, an, a, a, with a, an approved rule of life. Uh, and to live out the evangelical counsels of poverty, chastity, and obedience um, in the context of diocesan life. Um, so that's essentially what we do. The essence of our charism is uh, diocesan priests living in fraternity. It's, it's the fraternal life among diocesan priests, which I know in my own life, and I, I do believe for the life of the church, is so necessary for um, uh, living diocesan priesthood in our day and for uh, God willing, uh, just a deep renewal uh, of diocesan priesthood in our day. Um, so that's kind of uh, my own um, vocation story in a nutshell, if you will. Um, Thank you very and, much and for then, sharing that, Father. Okay, keep going. Yeah, ahead. absolutely. No, absolutely. Um, so the, the, the article then uh, came out of the, my experience in the Companions of Christ. Uh, so I don't know if you'd like me to go into that now or... Um, let's, in, in just a minute, let's, let's, uh, sure. stay with that where we're at for just another couple of minutes and then we will, um, spiritual husbands, spiritual fathers, priestly formation, in the 21st century is a truly unique book, um, mm-hmm. project brought together bishops, priests, lay experts, the introduction to the text notes that the goal of the book is to provide a spiritual and psychological resource that would engender effective maturity and fruitful chaste celibacy for the renewal of priestly formation. And this is a goal which was expressed by the Church in the 2016 Ratio Fundamentalis, the sixth edition of the Program for Priestly Formation. Um, This book is meant to be an essential guide for seminary formators providing the tools that are going to assist formation 
by taking into account that spiritual and human needs of the candidates while helping them to determine whether the same candidates are capable of the self-gift required by priestly celibacy um, and how to form them uh, deeply uh, in that unique and essential gift. Before we get into the conversation about the community and its, its role with the article, and I'd like sure. to do that next, could you just briefly speak to how you got involved with this phenomenal project? Sure. Yeah, it's essentially through uh, personal relationships. Um, the, one of the co-editors of the book, um, Bishop Andrew Cousins, is an auxiliary bishop of um, the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis here uh, in Minnesota. Uh, and he um, was, uh, before he became bishop, was a member of our community, the Companions of Christ, uh, and throughout throughout my six years in seminary, he was my uh, formation director um, and really just a, a spiritual father to me. Um, he uh, vested me at my or, a priestly ordination. So I certainly um, have a deep uh, love and respect for him. And then um, really uh, the invitation to participate in the book came through my own spiritual director, uh, Father John Horn. Um, who uh, has, uh, I believe, an article or two in the book and helped uh, to, to put the book together. Um, and he's a, a spiritual director uh, at St. Saint Saint, uh, Vincent de Paul Regional Seminary in, in Boynton Beach, Florida. So he's my, my own spiritual director and um, knowing my own, my own heart and my interests and also my, my academic work, uh, he invited me to to write this article. So I actually wrote this article specifically for uh, this book. For the book. I see. Mm -hmm. I have had the uh, uh, privilege of interviewing Father, um, Father Horn already uh, regarding his articles. Um, it was an interview with the then uh, Deacon Polikal, now Father Polikal, and I will right. be interviewing Father Horn again in about two weeks, I believe, um, regarding another article in the book that he had co-authored. Um, well, thank you for bringing it all full circle for me and, yeah. and making sense of how this, this project developed. Um, you mention in the book, uh, in the introduction to your, your piece, that there is a real organic way that your community came to the realization that Our Lady was present to each of you and desired to be your companion, accompanying each of you um, in a real and no less unique and real way than she accompanied the first apostles at Pentecost. Could you explain mm -hmm. how the significant realization was instrumental in writing the community's rule and how that parlayed into your graduate research and sure. this, um, this uh, chapter four in the book? Sure, yeah. So this was... Um when I was still a seminarian, um, our community, the Companions of Christ, uh, made the decision to uh, do a new version of our rule, uh, basically to, to, from scratch, uh, write our rule. Um, and it was based on this uh, reality that the first rule um, from 1992 was written while all the, f the first initial companions were still seminarians. Uh, and so now uh, this would have been um, oh, about 2008 or so, um, say 15 years later, um, there was a lot more experience uh, of the community uh, as a community of priests. And so we felt a desire to uh, do a rewrite of our rule. But we wanted it to be a real experience of prayer and also of um, kind of discerning more clearly what is the specific charism that God has given us as a community. And a charism is always a gift, uh, not just for that community, but for the whole church. So what is the gift that God has entrusted to us and is offering to the whole church through our community? Um, so we decided we would uh, take several um, uh, kind of mini retreats um, outside of our own personal retreats uh, where we would take uh, several days at a time and we would pray together uh, and then have discussions together. Uh, and we actually did, I think, three of these gatherings over the course of se several years, uh, usually around Christmas time. 
where we'd take several days. And we went out to um, a retreat center here in Minnesota that's uh, uh, part of the Schoenstatt uh, movement. Um, yes, uh, I'm if familiar you're familiar with that. Yeah, and so um, that's the place, that just kind of providentially, where we uh, where we uh, came together to meet. And so, one of the just uh, the aspects of this place is they have a beautiful reproduction of just a, of this small little shrine church uh, the, from the original uh, in Germany. Uh, and we would so we would pack in there to this little shrine church um, each day for our holy hours and for our, our time of prayer. Uh, and right above the altar is a beautiful image of Our Lady. Um, it's a special image venerated by, in the Schoenstatt uh, movement of Our Lady Thrice Admirable. Um, in and my so, home. <laughs> okay, there you have and, We have uh, a mother house here in, in the area, here in Waukesha, okay. so I'm very familiar. And we have, uh, I've made my promises, and we have our own Our Lady Thrice Admirable in our own home. Okay, beautiful. Beautiful, yeah, and and uh, they also have um, uh, a crucifix image where um, uh, it's not just our Lord on the cross. There's also his mother there, uh, drawing close to his side with a chalice, um, yes. which is really expressive of her um, her communion uh, and cooperation in his redemptive sacrifice, sacrifice and uh, receiving everything from him and giving it then to the church. Uh, and so there was just the physical reality of those images present with us this whole time while we prayed. Um, and as a community, uh, sometimes we, we will also vocalize in prayer um, during uh, Eucharistic adoration. A brother will uh, maybe share some um, word he feels uh, the Lord is putting on his heart. And over the course of these times of prayer, um, the theme of Our Lady and her love for us, her intimate desire to accompany us um, really came out very strongly. You know, uh, when the community was founded, there was no particular sense of a, uh, of a unique relationship to Mary. Um, and, and so at this kind of rediscerning of our charism, she came through very strongly um, and her love for us and our desire um, to consecrate ourselves to her in some very specific way, and even to write our own consecration prayer, uh, which is what is included at the end of uh, my article. Um, and so much so, so that as we discerned our charism, we decided, okay, for the new rule, we're going to have six chapters in this rule um, expressing different aspects of our charism. And one of the chapters is going to be on Mary. Um, and so originally it was supposed to be Bishop Cousins who was going to be the writer of our rule. Um, but in the middle of that whole process, he was made a bishop. And um, <laughs> bishops are very busy, as you know. Um, and so we decided, okay, we'll, ha we'll divide up the chapters um, among the brothers here. And by this point, I had been ordained a priest. Um, and providentially, the chapter on Mary um, fell to me uh, to, to write. And so I really enjoyed in my um, first years of priesthood and in my day off, um, spending time um, studying and reading and praying um, in order to write this chapter on, uh, on Mary. And one of the things that came through very clearly to me, um, it was just for me, it was a very joyful discovery, um, to see that Mary as companion of Christ is actually a very traditional title uh, for Our Lady, uh, that she shares our name, the companions of Christ. Um, right. And that's, yeah, that's the idea of Mary as socia Christi in Latin, uh, the companion of Christ, and that it has deep roots in the, the, the theological tradition, um, especially the sense of Mary as the new Eve, the associate, the helpmate, of the new Adam, Christ, uh, in his work. Uh, and it came, became just very clear that what she was desiring to show us as a community was, first and foremost, uh, to teach us how we can be companions of Christ, because she knows best of all. But also, there was a sense that she wants to be our companion. Um, and, and so that's, that's really um, the genesis of, of that. Um, so once, uh, after four years as a priest, I was sent to Rome uh, to do doctoral studies in the area of dogmatic theology um, in order to, to, to teach at our seminary. 
Um, and so when I went to Rome, I immediately had the idea, I, I want to pursue this, um, this topic, uh, this theme of Mary as companion of Christ. Um, and so that led me in my, in my doctoral work uh, um, to the figure of Matthias Schaben, um, a German, 19th century German theologian um, who writes very beautifully um, about Mary as companion of Christ and especially what he calls her uh, bridal cooperation at the cross. Um, so that's ended up being um, my, my doctoral topic that I'm still working on. Uh, if the listeners are out there, they can pray for me because it's, <laughs> it's a long, um, arduous process in some sense, but, um, but also uh, just a great blessing and very beautiful to be, be able to write on um, this, this area of Mary as Christ's companion, as Christ's spiritual bride, and especially her cooperation in, the, in his work at the cross. Um, that is a sweet topic for a dissertation. I mean, it is a really yes, magnificent topic. You, you hit a <laughs> phenomenal uh, topic there. Um, I, thank you for sharing organically yes. how that developed from your community. Um, uh, absolutely beautiful. You mentioned mm -hmm. that this is, you know, going back into history, uh, and I'm sure this is, is part of your work, I know it's part of the article, um, mm -hmm. the historical dimension that this is nothing new. This has mm -hmm. been there throughout history. Could you, could you elucidate that a bit? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, among the earliest Christians, one of the first things that that struck, uh, especially the, the church fathers, the earliest church fathers, was this parallelism between Mary, Our Lady, and Eve. Um, yes. You know, of course, St. Paul uh, in, in Romans chapter 5 speaks about uh, Adam as a type of Christ, very specifically. Uh, he does not say anything about Eve uh, in that in that uh, passage, uh, but it's very natural then for Christians to say, "Well, who is this new Eve? If there's a new Adam, um, and there's many answers to that because uh, it's a deep, mysterious reality. Uh, the new Eve is the Church, the Bride of Christ, um, but also uh, the new Eve is Mary, the mother of the new Adam." And it goes all the way back to the first promise of redemption in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the, the, the so-called Proto-Evangelion, uh, the first gospel where uh, God says to the serpent that he will put enmity between him and the woman and between his seed and her seed, uh, and uh, that her seed will strike the head of the, crush the head of the serpent while he strikes at their heel. Uh, so the first Christians and the church fathers uh, always saw in this uh, prophecy um, a, a foreshadowing not only of the new Adam, this, the seed of the woman who would crush the serpent's head, but also therefore this woman associated with him in, this, in the final victory over the evil one, uh, and that is Mary. And of course, very beautifully in the in the final uh, book of the Bible, we find these three figures together again. We have the serpent, uh, the woman, and her offspring, and that's in Revelation chapter 12. And again, the woman and her offspring engaged in war with the evil one. Uh, yeah. So the, exactly together. Um, and so uh, for the first Christians, especially uh, one of the the first. Um, theologians really to flesh this out was St. Irenaeus, who himself was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of the Apostle John, um, who developed this idea of Mary as the new Eve. Uh, and he even says that Mary, as, as Eve became a cause of sin, Mary became a cause of salvation. And, she, and he says that Mary became the advocate of Eve uh, by, uh, by her faith and obedience, uh, overturning Eve's sin and undoing the knot that was bound by Eve. So that's a sense of Mary as new Eve early on in the, in the Christian um, tradition. 
Now, when you in speak about the even and the West, that, that tradition has exactly. is, is held. I, I'm thinking of uh, the uh, Anya Parthene, the Rejoice on One Wedded Bride, um, that exactly. beautiful Eastern hymn. And this is this is a a concept that has existed from the beginning and and developed. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, it's it's um, it's, it's quite all right. Um, when we think about Adam and Eve, we think about a married couple, right? And so um, here we have Mary and Jesus. Uh, and on a physical level, of course, Mary is not uh, the, the wife of Christ, the bride of Christ. But um, there, because Christ is not only a man, he's also God, um, there's a sense in which uh, she has uh, a kind of multivalent relationship with Jesus um, because he is both God and man. Um, that she is not only mother, but in a spiritual sense, she is the bride. She is the representative of bridal Israel. Uh, Israel throughout the Old Testament referred very often, uh, especially in the prophets, uh, referred to as the bride of the Lord and, and God himself as the bridegroom. Um, also the church being the bride of Christ, uh, that Mary was a figure of, uh, and the, really the first member of that, of that bridal church. So although she is the mother of Jesus uh, in respect of his humanity, she's also his bride in respect of his divinity. Um, and so if it sounds strange to speak about Mary as both mother and bride of the same person, it's because we could say, I guess, the, the, the incarnation is strange. It's the union yeah. of, of humanity and divinity. Uh, St. Augustine speaks about uh, Mary as both mother and daughter of Christ. Uh, well, that's, that's equally strange. Um, so uh, just very early on, uh, at least by the fourth century, um, some church fathers began to explicitly refer to Mary as a bride of Christ. Um, and in, especially with respect to her identity as the new Eve, the, the adutrix, you know, the, uh, the, the helpmate of Christ. Uh, and gradually, especially by the Middle Ages in the Latin West, uh, began to use this title of Mary as companion, uh, helper uh, of Christ. And, and so that's part of the, the history of it. And it, it became very popular, uh, especially in the magisterial documents of the 20th century. Uh, so Pius XII, it's almost his favorite Marian title, uh, is Socia Christi, the Companion of Christ. Uh, and it makes its way into uh, the chapter 8 of Lumen Gentium, uh, the chapter on Our Lady um, in the Second Vatican Council, uh, where uh, Mary is uh, resp uh, explicitly referred to as uh, the Socia Christi, the Companion of Christ. So that's part of the, the historical background of it. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. It, from the beginning, even the concept Theotokos was so difficult to okay. grasp it, because of, of language and the richness of the mystery and right. the finite nature of the human mind to grasp the mystery in, in all of its aspects. You know, we look right. at things uh, linearly, sequentially, relationships in that way, not in the sense that, in the mysterious sense, where it is all happening at once, simultaneously. Um, but thank you very much for, for um, delineating that historical tradition. You mentioned on, on page 48 that priests likewise experience a certain duality in their relationship to Mary, though for obviously different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and I love the, the concept there of inseparable harmony being intrinsic, that mm -hmm. neither identity can be collapsed one into the other. Mm -hmm. Could you speak to this? Yeah, absolutely. So as we were uh, just saying, um, because there are two natures in Christ, human and divine, uh, that produces, with respect to Mary, a certain duality of relationship that she's both mother and bride. Um, and so as I was writing this, uh, this chapter, uh, that's a, a thought that occurred to me is that priests as well um, 
experience a kind of duality in their relationship to Mary and in their own identities. Uh, and it's not, <laughs> it's not because priests are both human and divine, that's for sure, but okay. um, that um, a priest is both a baptized member of the church, but he's also uh, ordained into the priesthood of Christ, configured to Christ the head. So he's a member of the body, but then he's also configured to Christ the head through a sacrament of holy orders. So in these two sacraments, uh, a priest, and I can say this on a, on a personal level, always experiences that sense of, well, I'm part of the church, and I am the voice of the church to God, especially during the holy sacrifice of the Mass. But yet at the same time, then I somehow represent and called to represent uh, God to the church and, and Jesus Christ, the bridegroom. Um, uh, John Paul II in Pastoris Dapovobis uh, speaks of priests as called to be a living image of Jesus Christ, the bridegroom of the church. Um, so it's kind of as a priest, it's which is it? Am I a member of the bride or am I uh, an icon of the bridegroom? And of course, the, the answer is it's both. Both. Um, uh, I actually have a friend, uh, uh, a consecrated young woman, and she said um, when she read this uh, uh, that it made sense to her because she has so many priest friends, and she experiences this duality in her relationship to the priests that she knows, that there's a sense of he's my brother in Christ, uh, but he's also my father in Christ. Um, right. And so she's saying even the laity experience this kind of dual identity of the priest um, in their relationships with him. Um, and so I, I, I have I, spiritual <laughs> sons that I started out as, as seminarians, one who was a, a Jesuit regent and uh, is now uh, ordained priest. And there is that duality. I, at one point, there is a filial relationship, and it continues even after ordination. But then you recognize them in persona Christi. So there is both that filial, we are both part of this, the body of Christ, but there is also that you are father. And I, even though I am 25 years older than you are, um, you are my spiritual father, and I am your daughter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, um, it's a, yeah, it's a profound mystery and, and something that, um, that requires kind of an ongoing, uh, for the priest, uh, and for, for all the other members of the church, just kind of ongoing contemplation of what, what does this uh, mean, uh, and what is God trying to say to us through all this? And one of the things I suggest in the article is that, um, because there is this sense of duality, maybe even tension in the priest's own identity, he can, and I know I can, be tempted to try to run from one aspect of the identity or the other, um, to try to run from uh, his, his configuration to Christ the head and say, no, no, I'm, I'm not any different than anyone else, right? And I'm just, a, sure. um, I'm just a, 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 another member of the body of Christ. Or uh, on the other side, uh, it's certainly very possible for priests to really forget their baptismal identity and how foundational that is, and, and uh, themselves as a member of the bridal church, themselves as having been redeemed and needing to be saved, uh, and, can, and can just uh, take refuge in their kind of spiritual authority and, and wield that in a, a kind of disordered sense. And so... Um, because of these, uh, these two kind of aspects of his sacramental identity, that's where I say Our Lady can really exercise a decisive role in helping the priest to, to integrate these two aspects of his identity. And that is by being both his spiritual mother, but also his spiritual bride. Um, and that's where I relate to um, uh, the priest's baptismal identity, that Mary is his mother. She gives birth to him um, uh, at the cross, especially. Uh, but she shows him how to be a member of the church, uh, a companion of Christ. Uh, she gives him life. But then uh, in respect of his priestly identity as, a, as, a, as configured to, to Christ the head uh, and bridegroom of the church, 
she then also uh, wants him to know that she is his spiritual bride and uh, really the most perfect icon of his bride, the church. Beautifully said. Around page 56, 57, you mentioned that St. Joseph also had initial discomfort in taking Mm. Our Lady um, into the intimacy of his heart as chaste bride. Um, and that, like St. Joseph, every priest is called to do so, and uh, like he experienced you know, this discomfort, but there is a way beyond it. Could you, mm-hmm. could you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. And um, speaking to the discomfort, um, as I often speak about uh, these things with brother priests, I, I do often encounter a certain um, squeebishness and <laughs> uh, discomfort because there's just uh, there's uh, priests are, are very much used to um, relating to Mary as, as their mother and she's uh, she's my mother and and so there's a fear there I think of um, well does this become a kind of sentimentalized thing um, uh, is it somehow even Freudian uh, is it strange uh, to, to think of Mary as my bride. I have a priest friend um, who, who said to me once, are you trying to make Mary my girlfriend? <laughs> and, <laughs> and of course not. Um, it's not to be uh, construed in that um, kind of uh, literalistic way or, or uh, because it tra- transcends uh, the physical. We're talking about a spiritual relationship here. Uh, so there is that, that, and there's that also, I think, deeper than that, there's a fear of, well, I, I'm not worthy of entering into right. that, uh, that relationship. I, um, I am uh, a sinful man, and there's a fear of uh, I could mess this up. Uh, uh, this could go wrong if I enter into this kind of relationship. And that's where I bring in the figure of St. Joseph, um, and, and his choosing to take Mary as his wife, uh, as, as the angel tells him, do not be afraid, uh, Joseph, son of David, to take Mary, your wife, into your home. Um, what, is, what was Joseph afraid of, right? Here I kind of follow the, uh, the opinion of many of the church fathers um, that Joseph did not suspect Mary's purity, right. um, but that there was a kind of reverential fear or awe of a sense God is at work here Um, this is too much for me I am a sinful man I need to remove myself from this Um, uh, and uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux as I quote in the article um, refers to that that doctrine of the fathers and um, even the word for uh, to to what we often hear as to divorce her quietly Really, the word in Greek literally just means to to send her away quietly, uh, to dismiss her. Um, now, it's it's possible I, uh, that that Joseph uh, had intended to legally divorce her. I don't think it's probable. Um, <laughs> maybe the church fathers say, "How could he know Mary and suspect her in the least?" And so uh, the interpretation then is perhaps Joseph was was afraid uh, of uh, the the enormity of what was happening in his, his uh, betrothed. Um, and so the Lord comes to him and his own annunciations say, Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. And you have a role here. You have a vocation. Um, and I, I think priests, we have that, that same kind of reverential fear in our relationship to Mary, also with relationship to the church. Uh, we are also yeah. called to... Uh, imagine being called to to have a spouse who, whom you know uh, is is sinless and and um, infinitely exalted above you. Um, how do you enter? How do you enter into that that intimate place with with her? Um, and and so priests experience that with the church as well. As um, I am espoused to a spotless bride. Um, how do I deal with that? And that's where I suggest that Joseph can kind of show the way that he humbly follows um, the Lord's call and, and, and allows himself uh, to be chosen for this intimate relationship. And then Mary herself 
shows him what that means, shows him what their, their, their marriage will look like, draws him into her own consecration uh, and perfect chastity. Um, so they are truly espoused and married. Uh, St. Right. Thomas Aquinas makes that very clear. It's a true marriage. Um, uh, but Mary then teaches him what, what that means and draws him into her own complete uh, consecration to God. Uh, and, and that and Joseph, by loving Mary, uh, is drawn into a deeper love of God. Um, and so that's where I say for the priest as well, there's nothing to be afraid of in entering into this intimate spiritual relationship with Mary because she's not going to uh, compromise your celibate chastity, she is going to strengthen and encourage it. Uh, and loving her, as you look upon her, her eyes are gazing on, on the Lord and on Jesus. Um, and that's the gift that she can give to the priest uh, if he allows himself uh, to, if he puts, a, puts aside um, uh, that, that temptation to run, to flee, uh, and stays where the Lord has put him in this relationship with Mary, that she can teach him then uh, how to live out his, his identity as a spiritual husband and a spiritual father. Beautifully said. And it, it fits so perfectly with the um, uh, dedication of the book to St. Joseph as icon of the father, chosen icon of the father, um, uh, and that relationship, that beautiful relationship there. Um, you know, if, if Genesis tells us that God recognized that it is not good for a man to be alone, of course right. he is going to give you um, a, a helpmate. Uh, and who better than Our Lady? Um, um, around page 57, one of the most beautiful concepts of, of your essay that, that, I, that I discovered is you, you state, our exploration of Mary's bridal relationship to the priest has thus yielded at least one significant insight of crucial significance for helping him to experience his celibate chastity as truly spousal and paternal love. Mary, as the mother of the church, presents herself to every priest as the mother of his spiritual children. I, just wrapping my brain around that, that was so beautiful. Um, mm. Could you expound on that? Yeah, absolutely, and I'm sure... <laughs> you being a mother yourself would have uh, even uh, uh, deeper insights as well um, into that significance. But um, again, there's, there's kind of a semi-autobiographical background here for me, at least, in, in coming to this recognition, Mary is the mother of my spiritual children. Um, I am uh, very close friends with a, a community of religious sisters, uh, newly founded uh, just about 10 years ago uh, here in Minnesota called the Handmaids of the Heart of Jesus. Um, and their whole charism is to uh, live the vocation of Our Lady, of Mary, in the diocesan family. Uh, so to specifically be um, inserted into diocesan life uh, and in the life of the parish. And one of the things um, uh, the foundress, Mother Mary Claire, um, has, has always repeatedly said, is, uh, she says, with the disappearance of consecrated women religious from many of our parishes, what in effect happens is the parish feels like a single parent family. Wow. Um, that the priest is there and he's father. Right. Uh, and people call me father. And, and therefore, the parishioners, have, of course, brothers and sisters in Christ, but also um, uh, entrusted to me as spiritual children. Well, who's the mother of my spiritual children then? <laughs> um, where is she? Uh, and, and, and so the realization that, well, that's Mary, of course, um, as the mother of the church, as the mother of every Christian. So what a, for me, it just it changed my perspective on I am not alone here in the parish, and um, I am not a single parent, and I was never called to be, um, that I have um, this companion, um, Mary, with whom I can um, jointly parent and, and generate and give life to these, uh, to these parishioners. Um, and so choosing then to turn to her in moments and asking for her help um, uh, 
one of the more beautiful ideas uh, uh, that that um, I read is just the idea that Mary, uh, as, as a mother's face, can be seen in her children. Um, so when a priest looks at his parishioners, he sees the face of Mary and vice versa. Um, and that's always helped me, I, uh, especially when it's, um, when it's hard to sometimes uh, the concrete reality of, of the church, the, uh, it can be messy, right? right. <laughs> and sometimes the, the human face of the church does not look like a spotless bride. Um, and so looking at Mary and learning to recognize her in, in those souls entrusted to my care really helps me to love them uh, in a new way. Um, and I learned to, to lean on her, her counsel, her aid. Um, she points out small things. Um, uh, uh, and, and it's just really um, keyed in to, to wanting to nurture the spiritual life of her children. And so uh, is that indispensable help uh, in that for the priest in the parish. Wow, that is a really beautiful concept. I mean, that is one that I, I took to prayer and sat with, and I can see how it, practically it means so much, but spiritually it also means so much, both as a comfort mm-hmm. for the priest to realize, no, you're not, you're not in this as a single parent, and you're not meant to be. Um, Our Lady is here as a, as a full partner, um, mm-hmm. as a full spousal partner here, and these are her children too. Um, and she's, if you let her, and she's not going to do anything without you asking, but if you mm-hmm. let her, she is right there. She is far too polite um, to, uh, to do this with, uh, and uh, trump sure. you in a sense, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, she, will, uh, she will not call that card. She will allow sure. you as spiritual father to have your authority. But if you turn to her as spouse and say, help me with this, you know, what do yeah. we do here? Um, uh, yes, as a parent of eight children, I've you know, come home with the, okay, what do we do now? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and thankfully, I've learned over all of these years of parenthood, um, and you probably see this in, in parish life too, that it is as if God has assigned each one of them a number or they, they discuss this ahead of time. We're not going to all you know, pile up on mom today. No, it's my turn. I've got this covered, you know. <laughs> um, and <laughs> uh, Our Lady can help you prioritize and see the bigger picture um, right. and take a, a breath. And when, like any parent, you have to walk out of the room and count to ten, um, she's there in your stead. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I love what you said about um, she never imposes herself. Um, and that's true throughout uh, the, the spiritual life that she will always um, make herself present when she knows she's needed. Um, but in order to point uh, the soul to, to her son, Jesus, um, and in, in the priest's um, spiritual fatherhood in the parish she she very much is the same way she's never going to impose herself but offer herself and and in many ways she yes she is more hidden um than than the priest in the parish family um he's a kind of visible head of the parish family um and she's hidden and so one of one of the really beautiful ideas that i first read in the works of matthias shaben uh this german theologian who i'm who i'm studying in his mariology is uh, he contends that the best image for Mary uh, as, as, as a member of the church is that she is the heart of the mystical body. Um, very often you read, especially in the, in the medieval uh, scholastics, um, of the idea of Mary as the neck, <laughs> um, and uh, Christ the head, and Mary's the neck through which the life of the head flows to the body. And there's a, there's a certain um, truth about that and beauty about that. Um, but when you think about the neck, it's actually kind of just inert, right? It's, it's right, just kind right. of a conduit, whereas Mary actively and freely uh, collaborates in her son's work, uh, but in a much more hidden way. 
Uh, and so Shea Ben, he's actually drawing this um, from a very obscure figure uh, named Ernest of Prague, uh, whom I had never heard of, uh, uh, 14th century. But the idea of Mary as the heart of this, the mystical body. And so there's a, there's a synergy, there's a complementarity between the head and the heart. Uh, and the heart receives all of her life uh, from the head um, and the, 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 the nerves flowing from the head and, and the heart then she silently pumps the life of the head throughout the body. Um, and so if you think about a human body, you need both the heart and the head. They're both pretty indispensable, right? Um, but they're not the same. Uh, and, and Pius XI in Casti Canubi, um, uh, encyclical on married life, he will also then employ this image for the domestic family, the natural human family of uh, the husband and father as the head and wife and mother as the heart, uh, and that both are needed. And so uh, in the parish... encyclicals, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And in the parish family then, um, I, I think it's, it's uh, the same way, that, that the parish needs a, a heart, uh, and that can really be provided by... She is the heart um, of the mystical body, and, and she's there... Um, distribute, distributing, mediating the life of grace uh, to every member of the church. Um, and I do believe, of course, it would be very nice if we could have a physical, personal manifestation of that in, in uh, consecrated religious women um, in parishes because that, that we're really missing that. Uh, but So that's a, a sense of um, how the priest can relate to Mary as, as the mother of his children, also the, the heart of, of his family in the parish. I love that concept of heart. Um, as a mother of both biological children and adopted children, uh, it's a concept that we've spoken of before in my house, where I have every mother who is a biological mother, those children grow beneath her heart. Um, mm. The, the womb is beneath the heart. So in your parish life, the, there is that sense of both being um, spiritually born because of Mary as mother of the church, but there is also an adoption. And for my children who are adopted, I've said, no, you did not grow beneath my heart within my womb. God put you right in my heart from mm. the very beginning. And... Mm you have both for those who are willing to accept the invitation of Our Lady to be that, that you know, spiritual mother, um, that spouse for the priest, the, the uh, bridal companion for the priest. Uh, it's a beautiful mm-hmm. concept, and there's just so much there. It is so rich. Mm. And, you know, this book is, is phenomenal. Um, It will no doubt be useful to seminary and religious community formators and rectors and bishops. Um, The entire book, I have been so impressed. I have read through it multiple times. Your essay has really, really caught me Um, and spent a time with it in prayer and intellectually. We are beginning to head toward the close of the show. Mm -hmm. Um, And as we are... uh, WCAT Radio is a product of uh, Holy Apostles College and Seminary. Um, we have bishops, formators, uh, um, seminarians who listen to the show. If you were speaking directly to that audience, men in formation, mm. their formators, if you have one nugget, what would it be? Mm. <laughs> I think it would be, especially if I'm speaking to my brother priests, uh, bishops, seminarians, um, it would just be this, that Mary is a real person, uh, and she desires, like any real person, to have a relationship with you. Uh, and, and just to impress upon, upon them the, the great blessing uh, that it has been for me in my life uh, to enter slowly but surely uh, in fits and starts and two steps forward, one step backwards, um, into this relationship with Mary, that she's a real person. She's not just a a, a picture. uh, She's not just a statue. Um, uh, uh, She's a flesh and blood person. She currently is flesh and blood in heaven. Uh, And 
so that she, um, she's much more than the stereotyped image uh, that we often kind of unconsciously um, uh, receive in our religious formation. And just to not be afraid to speak to her in prayer and sp most of all, just spend time with her in prayer. Um, and I guess I can, I can give a, just a tiny little grace um, for my own prayer um, that I think might, would be appropriate and, and encouraging to, to my brother priest. And that would be, um, I was meditating on the hidden life of Nazareth and just the, uh, the beauty of, of uh, the Holy Family in Nazareth. And in this particular time of prayer, I was kind of finding myself in the place of Joseph um, in, in the Holy Family and um, just spending time in the house and uh, outside the house with Mary and with Jesus. Uh, and I remember there was a certain point that I, I felt a deep unworthiness, uh, a sense that I had nothing to offer, nothing to contribute uh, to this family. Um, and I expressed that to Mary, uh, you know, why do you, why do you want me here, basically? Uh, and she, uh, in this prayer and my meditation, she said to me very clearly, she said, we're a family. Uh, and that's that's all I need. That's all she needed to say. It wasn't. Uh, no, you are worthy. Really, you are worthy. Well, no, I, I'm not. But we're a family, and families stay together, and families support one another, and families always accept one another. Um, and so there's just that look in her eyes of acceptance and of love, uh, and just how healing and um, what a great blessing that was for me. And so just to my brother priest. Um, to not be afraid to, to speak to Mary, to spend time with her. She's a real person, uh, and she will love you in a way. The Lord can use her to love you in ways that are, that are especially um, necessary uh, for each priest. And, it, and the relationship will look different and unique for every soul, uh, for every priest. Um, but she's waiting there, and she's offering that. Uh, so don't be afraid. Spend some time in Nazareth. Spend some time in, in the upper room. Uh, awaiting the Holy Spirit with Mary at the cross uh, and, and see uh, what, in what ways uh, she can love you and elicit love from you in return. That is beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Father mm -hmm. Coop, as we are nearing the end of our program, would you be so kind as to lead us in a closing prayer? Sure. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving God, most holy trinity, we thank you for your most perfect creation, our blessed Mother Mary. We thank you for offering her to us as a model and guide in the spiritual life, as mother and as a sister. We place in her immaculate heart all our needs and desires, grants the grace to be generous in allowing her into our own hearts, into our own homes, as John the Beloved did. Mary, we ask you now to pray for us, and especially to pray for all priests. As we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father Evan Koop, thank you for being my guest on Vows, Vocations, and Promises, Discerning the Call of Love, sharing your story, your work, chapter regarding Our Lady as the Bridal Companion of Christ, the Bridal Companion of the Priest, this substantive new book is available via and route books and media, and it's entitled Spiritual Husbands, Spiritual Fathers, Priestly Formation for the 21st Century, and it was edited by Bishop Philippe Estevez and Bishop Andrew Cousins. And thank you, guests, for tuning into this WCAT program. I'm Dr. Marianne Arlakis, um, and Father Coop, we will be praying for you. Please pray for us as well. Amen. Thank you. Of course I will. And thank you for having me. Thank you. Hello, God's beloved. 
I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.